Hi. What do we have here? Hi, everyone. Oh, my goodness. It's so awesome to see so many people joining today. Awesome. Yes, Naomi and Master Alan here with you guys tonight. Uh, thank you for responding to the call as we um, just wanted to create a space for parents to come together to uh, really just you know, ask questions, share experiences, but most of all, support each other because this is what this is about. Tonight is really a relaxed night. It's really, um, you know, you're supposed to BYOB. So let me see what you guys brought. Who's got, I have tea because <laughs> I'm on a detox and he's having wine, but let me see. Real facts, she hasn't <laughs> eaten solid food in like this is day number four. There's a problem. Day number four, she has not eaten solid foods. And there's a doctor so involved. So yeah. You, uh, <laughs> Don't you, worry. you would not want to have me on a Zoom call if I was four days without eating, without food. You would not. I'd be like, ah. That is why. Actually, I have to tell them about my mug. I got this for Christmas from Miss Amelia, one of our coaches. And as I'm not saying I'm Wonder Woman, I'm just saying nobody has ever seen me and Wonder Woman in a room together. We know that, right? <laughs> that true. is, uh, for all of you as parents, I think this has been uh, one of those years where, um, you know, we truly have found ourselves to become our own heroes because we've had to redefine how we do life. We've had to redefine our, um, you know, just our plans for year 2020. And now even more with 2021, it's more like, well, let's see what happens. But a few weeks ago, I posted um, asking questions in, in terms of what challenges parents are facing these days. And the response was so overwhelming in a good way. Yes. It was so good to hear that parents wanted to talk about this. So we decided, okay, let's do this. Let's put it together. Um, and, and then also let's, let's tap into all the resources that we have in the community. So it's really exciting to be able to see because you know, sometimes as parents, right, we're really awesome at what we do um, professionally. And then we bring it home. I'm a teacher. I'm speaking as a teacher. Yeah. You bring it home and it's so hard to implement it with your own children. Any other teachers? Well, Let we me, have I'm a few teachers. We have Diana here. We have Don't. Maglio here. <laughs> The rocks, the teachers of the year in the house. That's so right. We have some awesome teachers here. So sometimes, right, it's like so hard for us to even be able to implement that with our own children. And we know what the books say. <laughs> and we know what works in the classroom. But when it comes to our own children, it makes it so much harder. Yeah. So we wanted to just really support each other in that way and, and encourage each other to be able to implement those things and really know that, no matter what you're doing, as long as you continue trying, and really you, you, the fact that you're here tonight, it just says you, you're awesome. Absolutely. You, you are, you wanna learn how to do this, you wanna do it better. Uh, no one's an expert, but many people here are experts in different areas. So what are we doing? We're gonna tap into what's your area of expertise, let's come together and let's learn from each other. So I see a few people joined us today. Actually, I'm really excited to see some really awesome people from North Arlington and some really awesome people from Belleville as well. Uh, we even have a few, I'm not, today they're just parents, but we even have a few who are, um, you know, Board of Education trustees. And I just think that their insight also to see what, what a year has been for those of you making decisions at the high level. So uh, thank you for everything you've done, just trying to keep the children safe and really, um, you know, yeah. resuming some normalcy. And um, I, I think one of the most important things is also trying to, the, the mindset, it's been, you know, the, one of the biggest challenges I think for, for me this year is, how to stay in a positive mindset, right? Yeah. Through, and this year, I mean, you know, for the last year, uh, how do you stay in a positive mindset? And obviously we, we all know we should, and we all are attempting to do it, but how do we do that, right? Because uh, sometimes we're just bombarded with so many challenges, uh, so many pivots this year. Uh, so staying in that positive mindset is really important. Uh, and one of the key things that I found is being in a positive environment, right? So yeah. finding, positive, like-minded individuals where we can come together and I can influence you to be positive, you can influence me to be positive, and we can help each other out in that way, right? I think that's very, very key uh, because by ourselves, it's going to be very difficult. Uh, and that's, I think, one of the reasons we did this early on in uh, April and May. We did a few parents hangouts like this, and it was awesome. 
a lot of relief for a lot of parents and just bounce back to know a there's other people going through the same thing that we're going through yep. right that's a big thing so it's like okay it's not just me going crazy right it's other people struggling with these same things um and two trying to influence each other to laugh make some jokes it put some positivity into this so that we could all come out of this with a positive attitude. I think that's the first step. If we have a positive attitude towards it, everything else will be able to conquer. So with that being said, I want to start off really quick with open up on your chat. And I want to know when you think about virtual learning, right? Specifically virtual learning. I want to hear one positive word in the experience of virtual learning, it could be from the teacher's perspective. I know there's a few teachers here, um, uh, you know, doing this, who had to figure that, that out to the parents. I want to hear a positive words. So let me give you some positive words. What's, what has been good outcomes from doing uh, this with your, with your children in this past year? So how's that gone? Talk to me. I'm looking at the chat. I see um, someone, Petra says, more insight and focus on at-home strategies. Mm. That's really good. That's true. We actually put a lot of uh, new content on our app where we were pu putting, you know, um, martial arts tutorial, training yeah. videos. We did at-home coloring sheets and character development things, things that we never had thought to do before that makes it easier for children to be able to continue practicing and developing at home. That was new ways that we were able to innovate because of this. So, you know, yeah. thank God for that. So I'm sorry, I have a few parents who are trying to log in still. So we have Liz says independence for my daughter. Mm, that is true. That's a big deal. Um, yeah, we, I, we've seen, um, you know, both sides. Obviously, there's kids have been struggling with uh, social anxiety, with being separated. But we've also seen the opposite. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of kids come out and become more confident and more independent workers through working through this way. So there were some kids, um, in particular, I was, I was speaking with uh, a mom just the other day where her child went through a lot of bullying situations yeah. at school, in the physical school. And being able to come out and uh, do Zoom for this time has really helped them kind of reinvent themselves. And, and he's feeling a lot more confident even coming out in public and interacting with other kids now because he was able to distance himself for a period of time from that uh, environment and then be able to come back and say, and he was, with his own words, says, I feel more confident, I feel more comfortable talking to people, approaching people, stuff like that. So there's on both sides. So that, that's really, really good news there. Oh. Anybody else? Okay, I'm typing so you can see where you can write it. You can type here what word comes to mind when you think of virtual learning, or we can unmute you really quick if you wanted to share that with us. You can also raise your hands, yeah, and let, let me know if you want to speak. We have some people trying to join. Hold on one second. Yeah, we do have a few parents that didn't get a chance to get the registered. And one of the reasons why we did this with the registration was just for the sake of having a little bit more of this privacy. You know, this isn't being broadcasted anywhere. We are not on Facebook oh, as much as we share the event, but this time, this is an opportunity for you to, um, you know, just really tap into the resources and the great minds that we have tonight. Uh, Nancy says, learning how to navigate technology on their own. She's become a good typist at seven years old. Yes. And typing is like huge. one of those skills that like kids are just, you know, yeah. like that was, I, I went to school like a long time just, ago. We had to learn how to do that. <laughs> now it's like, yeah, this is something you. Some of you guys are laughing. I know you went through that, right? I wasn't the only one or the teacher's like, extra, you got it. Like, what is this awkward? Yeah. <laughs> so, this is so weird. Oh, I love this one. Nadia says, time to bond when time, bond when time allows. Mm. So, you know, just being able to bond as a family and come together. And I know that some of you are like, that's not happening at home. That's <laughs> it's okay. a different kind of bonding. That's okay. Um, but, you know, it's, so, it's such an exercise in uh, really looking into what is going positive. Because anytime I ask anyone, how is it going? I get it. You know, it's a lot. Um, but when we exercise 
that gratitude to say, let me find what's positive, that automatically changes the chip. And yes. there's an actual response in your brain where now we are, you're smiling. Some of you are smiling. Some of you are chuckling like, yeah, <laughs> no, but don't worry. I promise you by the, at the end of tonight, you're going to walk out with some excitement about virtual learning and trying these things out. Super excited. Wait, what is Peach love- said? Petra says, typing is actually incredible for developing intrinsic hand strength. That's the expert speaking right there. And I think we're actually ready to get to the expert. Yeah, so let me just now we're going to talk about motor skills and yeah. we're going to start getting into what's involved when it comes to typing. Uh, some of those five motor skills is amazing. Yeah, what the, what the kids have been able to develop in that. I just wanted to make sure that we have a pair. So, right. Yeah. So let me introduce you guys uh, to someone I got to meet a few years ago. And um, it's one of those people that when you meet them, you really like, you feel like you already know them for a very, very long time. Right, Pete? It was like that. Yeah. We were having drinks on that time. Like it just, we've always known each other. Uh, but I think when, where we were able to connect so much was about the passion for changing, um, you know, people's lives through what we do through our job when you find somebody when you meet someone who's so passionate about their job you really say like this is someone I want to be around so you know as life would have it one day she decides to show up to martial arts and here we are and now her children are training with us as well Um, but she also happens to live in the same town we live here in Belleville and um, you know what Petra brings to this it's in a, in such a different level uh, when I got to see something that she did with her children during the time of the lockdowns I said I sent it to him I remember I sent it to you and I said this is amazing like we need this um, so I'm not even going to pump her up anymore uh, you guys are already seeing what an awesome person she is um, from my bio about her but she truly is uh, at such so much knowledge and so much wealth. So I would just to, so that you know how we're going to do this. If you think of any questions as she's speaking, do me a favor and type it on the chat. I'm going to be monitoring the chat. And then at the end, we are going to answer all those questions. I, we, I'm going to read it to her, but don't like right there. If you think of it at that moment, go ahead and put it in the chat. And then we're going to circle back to all of those questions. All right. So there she is, Mrs. Petra Rivera. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you. Wow. That's like an incredible intro. And I hope I could live up to all of your words now that I'm speaking to everybody. But um. Just a quick aside about me. Um, I am a mom of three. Um, I do live in Belleville. I am a pediatric occupational therapist. I work for the New York City Board of Education. Um, I've almost been an occupational therapist for almost 20 years, which is kind of crazy to even hear me say out loud because I feel like I just graduated college. Um, But I actually also work at the college that I graduated from and I'm I'm an adjunct professor at Dominican College. Um, But aside from all of that, I'm also a mother of um, a son with auditory processing disorder and a visual disorder that also he has a diagnosis with of dyslexia. So as much as an occupational therapist, I am for my students at school and I do work in District 75, which is um, solely special education. Um, I specialize in working with children with autism, but I have worked across um, many, many vast uh, diagnoses and um, age ranges but I also am a mother of a son who has specialized learning needs. So virtual learning for me, um, you know, I now uh, Naomi gave a great intro before about, you know, even if you're a teacher or you work in a school, you know, you know all these things that you have to do, but when you're a parent, it kind of levels the playing ground. And I feel like we're all on that same level. And now my dog's going to bark because now I'm talking. Um, so you know, for myself, being an occupational therapist, virtual learning hit, and I had to now start doing virtual occupational therapy over a screen for my students with autism, who really I am very hands-on with in a sensory gym. So I was dealing with that stress and having my three children on virtual learning in my same home with my son who has specialized learning needs, who can't look at a screen for too long, and who has all this stuff going on as well. So, um, you know, to say that as parents, I do feel like we are definitely part of the superheroes in this whole equation. I'm not even saying because, you know, we've really had to change the entire way that we think about um, helping our children in a completely different way. So I'm going to try to stay on track. Naomi, you need to give me like a, you know, if I start going off on a tangent, because it will happen frequently. Um, because I really want to be talking as a parent 
and helping you guys as much as I can with what we've been dealing with on this end, but I might get clinical. I might have to get a little bit clinical, but just redirect me and I'll jump right, I'll jump right on wherever I need to be. Um, so I know for myself, especially in the heart of the lockdown, I feel like one of the biggest issues was the fact that we were all home, right? And we weren't going anywhere and there was no outlet for ourselves or our children. There was nowhere to go. They weren't in school socializing. They weren't playing the way that they typically do with their friends. Um, and, you know, I'm talking about play, but play is actually a very big piece of virtual learning. Um, because when you think about school and you think about the environment of school and the culture of school and what is entailed, um, I'm going to be talking about something called our sensory system, which some of you may hear, you know, may have heard about sensory systems. It may be a very novel um, word to some of you, but the, our sensory systems, we all have them and we all kind of adjust and adapt to be able to function um, in everyday life. So typically all of us here have learned through life how to regulate ourselves and our sensory systems so that we can function, you know, to whatever's happening. And there's actually a lot of research right now happening on how the sensory systems um, model and shape your personalities, which is really, really cool. But if you think about it, how many of you sitting here now, you know, when you were in school had chewed up pen caps? You know, or if you are doing something and sitting, you're munching on something like ice, or you have to study with music on, or just your everyday routines that you do. Without you even knowing, you have developed your own sensory strategies to help you get through and structure your time. So now with children, you know, if there is some type of sensory processing, either sensory processing issue, or if there's a tremendous change to the sensory system, a child might not understand what's happening and might need that help and support to be able to regulate their overall system. So what we're really looking for is kind of like that just right um, kind of feeling in your skin. In other words, I'm, I'm gonna really try to not use like all of my clinical terms, right? So um, there's all different levels of, um, arousal, you know, some kids are very, very high, um, where, you know, they're very, very active, constantly moving, constantly fidgeting. Um, you know, then we have children who are kind of need to be revved up a little bit for them to maintain that attention. And unfortunately, sitting in front of a computer for all of this time that is entailed for virtual learning, kind of counterbalances your entire system, you know, even before any of this happened, when you think about when you stared at a screen, like if you're not in a profession where you were on a screen for a long amount of time, just the general fatigue that it gives to your eyes and 80% of sensory information actually comes in through your eyes. So when you think about that system being stressed in that type of way and that drastic change, it actually affects the rest of your body. So back to school and we think about walking into a school building, there's so many, um, how can I call them? Almost like just things in the environment that help our child um, monitor their sensory systems. Whether it's like a school bell going off that gives them that auditory input of my day is starting and then they know their structure and their routine, which structure and routine is also very, very important for the sensory system to be able to be predictable, right? We like kind of predictability. Our bodies like to know what's in store for them. Our bodies really don't want any like sudden surprises because on a nervous system level, um, we startle, right? If you hear a really loud noise that you're not anticipating, your body is gonna jump probably before you even hear that sound. Um, that goes down to us feeling sound waves in our joints, which that's a whole other conversation that I'm not even gonna get into. But you know, when you think about a school day, all of these things, a school bell, even just walking in line to a classroom, um, sitting down, even the smells like of a school, the smell of having a pencil on your desk, I know that that sounds silly, but all of those things are regulating and kind of get your system ready to learn. Um, so I feel like this was one thing, you know, when it comes to virtual learning, our children have these kind of made up 
structures in their body of, okay, this is how I learn. And now they're waking up and they're sitting in front of a computer and this is our new way of learning. So, um, you know, I'm just going to get into just some strategies that um, you guys could possibly utilize that might be helpful. And don't get me wrong, I utilize some of these strategies myself because I feel that I need to help my self-regulation sometimes as well. So, and if you have any questions or if you've been noticing anything specific that's been like a challenge or anything, you could always type it in the chat and I could always go back to it um, after. But I'm speaking not only as an OT, but as a mom, because I'm not one of those OTs that demand all these things from my parents, like in a perfect world. Well, you should really have a structure and a schedule and a this and a that. Like I'm a parent, so I'm completely realistic. And I totally get that in real life, a lot of the time as parents, these things just can't happen, right? We all have our days. We all have our off days. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just kind of trying to find a system that works best for your family, I think. Um, so if you've been noticing, well, first, let's just talk about workspace. I know that that's something that I struggled with tremendously at the beginning of this, because like I said, I was home doing my treatment sessions, which, um, you know, those are all HIPAA protected and I can't have anybody walk into my session. So I had to be completely closed off and logged on to do those in a separate space in my home. And then I needed three learning stations for my kids. And I live in a tiny house in Belleville. So like, I didn't really know how this was happening. Um, but one of the things that I realized very, very quickly, especially for my son who does have um, the dyslexia and the visual disorder and the auditory processing was I really had to make a designated workspace as close to like, so that that could be his at home school. Once I did that and I organized his space, like I just got like a little milk crate cubby. I put it to the side. I organized all of his books. I wrote on the spines for him. It's color coding that I have to do um, because he can't take in too much visual information at once. But I just felt the need to really organize him as best as I could as he was sitting at his workstation. Another thing for him that I really had to do in his workstation was I had to buy one of those, like, you know, the science fair poster boards, like the three fold boards. I had to get that for him. And I actually had to section off his line of vision, because if not, he's sitting at the computer, he's looking at what the dog is doing. My stepson comes out of his room, he's looking around. So I really needed to kind of block off his range of vision so that he was focused solely on the screen. And then I would actually have some visual distractions on that board that he could like divert to if he needed a visual break, but nothing that was so distracting. Um, also for him, something that he needed was I had a therapy ball nearby um, because my one son fluctuates between a really low level of arousal and then out of nowhere, he will bounce into a really high level of arousal. So for him, it's like I had to have a balance of both calming and alerting things to keep him kind of focused through his day. So I had a therapy ball put off to the side and I kind of went through this whole program with him. It's actually called How Does Your Engine Run? And we've used it before and I've used it with a lot of my um, younger students. But for my son, it really helped him identify within his body, like what his body needed at any given time. And if he was feeling like he was falling asleep, which I've caught all three of my children sleeping on screen because they're home and they're looking at a screen. Um, but I tried to you know, have him identify when his body, like if he noticed that he was really slouching down, you know, or if his posture was lagging, it would kind of be a cue to him to get the ball. And he would actually sit on the therapy ball while he was doing online learning. It gave him the chance to bounce if he needed it, because believe it or not, anytime our joints kind of press against each other. So like think about working out when you're doing push-ups and your shoulder joints are kind of pushing against each other. That movement is giving your brain signals as to where your body is in space. So it kind of increases arousal levels because your brain starts kind of working like, oh, this is what I'm doing. I'm sitting here in front of the computer. So I had to do a lot of work like that. So I would say like designating a workspace. And like I said, my house is extremely small. So I completely get it. I know that I work for New York City Board of Ed. And one of the things was 
students can't be doing school from their bed, but my one son had to do school from his bedroom and he had to sit on his bed with his computer, um, but I just had to figure out a way to make it more of a workstation and not a sleeping space and kind of shift that mindset of that environment. Um, so if you have a student who's at a really, really low level, so this is your kid who really has a hard time attending, who might be very floppy and might have like lower muscle tone, um, you want that kid to have frequent movement breaks in between virtual learning. And, and here's the thing too, with virtual learning, these kids need to move. They can't just sit for hours at a time and look at a screen. Um, it's actually innately not what our body does. You know, in school, when you think about it, they're given, they're not just sitting in a desk, whether it's, you know, standing up to sharpen a pencil or going to the bathroom or different breaks that are entailed in their school day. Um, even just talking to other students and visually being alerted, moving your head. Um, there's another sensory receptor called the vestibular system that's actually located in your inner ear. And just turning your head and inverting your head actually stimulates that system. So in a school setting, them being alerted to different noises without even really thinking about it, it's helping them regulate. So we need to give them these same opportunities while they're sitting in front of a screen and not just sitting and staring at the computer all day. Um, but especially kids who are lower arousal, you know, I would say every 15, 20, 30 minutes, they need to be up moving. So whether that's doing jumping jacks, doing frog jumps, going outside in the backyard really quickly and like taking a lap, um, making a quick obstacle course in your home. You know, for my students at home, like I was having parents use painter's tape because it's relatively inexpensive. You could get it at the dollar store and it won't create any damage to your walls or your floors. You know, and even like just giving them visual targets on the floor with painter's tape. Okay, jump five times here, do two jumping jacks here. Like I would put, um, X's on the walls, do some wall push-ups here. It's just something to get them going. Um, any type of um, hanging and swinging, which at home that might not really be doable, but maybe if you have a tree outside or like, um, I know I had to buy for one of my door jams, like a pull-up bar, just for them to just swing and hang. Because again, all of the separation of those joints give those same kind of signals to the brain. Um, now, if you have a kid who has a very hard time sitting in front of the computer and is constantly moving and can't sit still, um, these are the kids that need, we call it heavy work. They need a lot of proprioceptive input. So this input, again, gives these, these joints and it gives signals to the brain and it creates a calming response. So these are the kids that might have to, and my parents loved me for this one at home. I was like, you know, have them help you bring the laundry basket up to their room. And they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, have them help you in the house because all of these heavy work type activities, this is what their body is craving. They kind of need these things to help regulate their joints. So any type of heavy work, it could be carrying a laundry basket. Um, it could be doing wall push-ups. It could be, um, you know, doing wheelbarrow walking. That's another good one. You know, it's giving, you hold, you know, your child's legs, have them wheelbarrow walk. I even do it like, I would put like books on the other side of the room and they'd have to wheelbarrow walk to get the book and then go back to their learning station. Um, you know, I've always been creative as an OT, but I feel like virtual learning has like really upped the ante of creativity of what to do with my own children. Um, but some other really great resources that you could kind of divert to during um, virtual learning, especially for a kid who is very um, high arousal, there's a website called Cosmic Kids Yoga. And it's really good for younger kids because she kind of, it's separated by time. So there's like five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And she's kind of telling a story. It's an interactive story, but she has them act out in yoga poses, all of these things that she's talking about. Um, that's something that was very, very helpful just for like a calming movement break. Also, any type of, I know weighted blankets, like I've always used a weighted blanket as an OT and weighted vests, which I don't love, but um, weighted blankets have become all the rage in normal society lately. Having a weighted blanket on your child's lap actually helps to give them that proprioceptive input and helps their um, arousal level. And if you don't have a weighted blanket, something easily that I make with my parents 
either with a hot glue gun or sometimes I'll just tie a knot, get an old t-shirt, fill it, um, obviously not the neck and the sleeves. Or if you want, you could kind of hot glue gun it um, and fill it with rice and have your own child make their own weighted lap um, pillow. And they could decorate it how they want. You know, I mean, you could really do whatever you want with this, but it kind of is good to have them involved in the process. Um, and I think just breaks, you know, something that I know everybody's virtual learning looks different. Some students are live in person on um, the whole time. Others have different times of day that they're online, but breaks are essential. Um, you know, I feel like it's very detrimental to just have um, your child sit and I was very guilty of it too. Like I said, I was upstairs doing my treatment sessions and I'm like, if you don't log on to your class, you better sit there and make sure that you log on. Um, but that just created high stress for everybody. Um, also a big thing is, you know, visually, ch children really do need a break from staring at the screen. Um, so definitely factor in visual breaks. So between, I would say every 15 to 20 minutes, they really need to stop looking at the computer screen and divert their attention to do something else. Um, let's see, I took notes of all um, timers. Something that's really good that I feel like also during um, virtual learning, because like I said, in school, there's different things that without them knowing, cue them as to what time it is, whether it's a change of bell schedule or they hear like, the lunch delivery coming, or they know at certain times during the day, certain things happen in their environment that aren't necessarily happening at home. So sometimes it could just feel like, oh my God, when is this going to be over type of deal? Um, so using timers has been incredible for us because I've been able to say, okay, look, you're working on this for 15 minutes. And I set a timer and my kids know when that timer goes off, it's either time for a break, um, or at the beginning of the pandemic to go eat because we were just eating nonstop in this house. They just didn't stop eating. Every break was like snack time, um, which was another huge issue, but um, also the use of visual schedules was also very helpful. I know I'm jumping around everywhere, I'm sorry. I just wanna make sure that I'm catching everything. So um, just that expectation of what their day is going to look like like on a visual schedule in front of them so that they know, okay, my day is starting out and I'm gonna be in ELA. And then at this time I'm going to this. That visual reminder, believe it or not, helps them to structure and to um, give their bodies a warning as well. You know, I mean, how many times, like I know like if I'm doing a workout and I'm really hating it and I'm like, okay, but I just have 10 more minutes. Like I can hang in for 10 more minutes. But if you don't have that time limit, you just feel like this is going to go on forever. And then your attention is going to go and you're not going to, you know, be as invested. So that is something that also has been extremely helpful. Um, some strategies also to look into, you know, because visual fatigue is a real thing. You know, it's really not, for the most part, the kids wanting to get out of work. This is a real um physical thing that is happening to these students' bodies from screen time. So something that's good thinking about is turning down um, the screen brightness on the computer and turning up the contrast. That just gives the eyes a break a little bit and they're not staring um, into this really harsh kind of light at all times. Um, also like, you know, the different features that computers have of how to zoom in, you know, virtual learning has been new for everybody, including teachers. And sometimes material is posted in a way that it's not as easily accessible as it can be. Um, and for myself too, I've had these issues as well, but there are different formats on your very computer that just help you kind of enlarge fonts and screen prints and things like that. There's actually a lot of great programs um, through Google that help with all doing all of that kind of stuff and they're for the most part free so those are great to really look into um to help with seating i talked about very very briefly but seating is huge um your child having a, a supportive um seating system and also a flexible seating system you know not just a very rigid this is my seat that i'm sitting in at this whole time you know have a variety of options whether it even just being like having a pillow for them to put on the chair. Um, 
Amazon sells seat cushions, which are kind of like, um, you fill them up with air and you kind of fill them as much as you want. You can make them really, really hard so that there isn't much wiggle, or you could fill them up halfway so that your kid can kind of wiggle in their seat, which is really helpful for attention. Um, okay, I think that I've kind of chewed your ear off on all the facts that I wanted to get down to you, but I just wanna share with you if any of you are a part of Belleville Strong, you may have seen this during the pandemic, but I know for myself um, and for my students that I was treating in their homes, you know, I treat in a beautiful, I'm very lucky that my principal believes in sensory integration and I have an amazing sensory gym that I'm able to bring my students into every day. And um, I've been a therapist for a very long time and doing virtual therapy was not only so hard, it was so disheartening as a therapist um, because I, didn't have that hands-on. So something I was having my parents do at their homes once the weather got nicer last spring was to create sensory chalk walks in their homes because you know, their kids weren't getting the input that I was giving them at school and they were seeing a lot of regression, which you know, we saw regression with our, for the most part, neurotypical children um, as well. Then I started doing them with my parents at home and I was like, my kids could really benefit from this. So I started doing it with my own kids as a break at home. So just quickly back to the sensory system, any type of jumping, hopping, skipping, actually spinning, um, all of these things activate all of these different sensory systems within your body. And it really helps you to self-regulate. So this is my son actually demonstrating. I'm gonna share my screen really quick. Um, okay. Can you guys see my screen? Just give me a thumbs up if you guys could see it. Good. Okay. So don't mind my obnoxious intro, but this was, um, a sensory chalk walk that I had done in front of my home. Sorry, hey, Peter, I think we don't have audio. Oh, yeah? Hold on. Okay, I'll just talk you through it, though, because this is just me giving. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I okay. can hear you. So I'll just talk you through it, because you don't need to hear my obnoxious intro that I gave <laughs> on this. Um, but I'm basically just explaining what I just told you guys about, you know, the importance of giving sensory input and kids being able to get it as well. So this is my son. <laughs> well, two of my sons, but one of them is. It was so windy on this day that I literally put the chalk down and within 10 minutes, the chalk literally had blown off of my sidewalk. But you'll see. So he's gonna start with just hopscotch and just jumping feet together, feet out, feet together. Not only is he working, you can't see it on there. There's like, um. Hold on, I'm gonna pause it. Um, there's actually, there was visual trackers on the ground. So along with him bringing his feet out and together, he was kind of visually tracking. And if it was one dot, he had to open up his legs. If it was two dots, he had to close his legs. So working on a variety of, of systems at the same time kind of help everything pull together. Now this number eight in front of you, it might just look like a number eight, but actually walking a number eight completely activates that vestibular system that I was talking about that's located inside the inner ear. Um, just that motion of, of kind of the infinity symbol, it, it causes the fluid in your inner ear to shift and it creates that regulating piece. So this is him. And this was actually something in vision therapy that my son PJ worked on a lot because he was unable to do this completely. Okay, and now there was the alphabet in different bubbles. Now I was focusing on preschoolers when I made this one. So obviously I'm working on the alphabet with my preschoolers, but if I was gearing it toward older students, you could do anything. You could put multiplication on there. You could put 
sight words, anything that your child is really interested in, you can do that. So even you'll see him having a hard time here, even just walking these loop the loops, see how his head is kind of stationary and the body is moving, that's activating that whole vestibular system. <laughs> and you really have to have them keep their head up, which he wasn't doing. So these are frog jumps, which I mentioned before, and this is the whole body exercise. And then skipping. And there are little cues on the floor as to like what he was supposed to do. So it was like skip here, do five jumping jacks, skip here, do another five jumping jacks. And then he's doing more skipping. And then 10 jumping jacks, which I don't know that he did, but um, but see, all of these things and going through this course, I mean, going through this course once has me tired, but for them, they could go through it three or four times before. And then we were doing, we were working on yoga. So we ended with a tree pose for 10 seconds, which after doing all that spinning was kind of amazing that he was able to do that. Okay, let me pause this. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Oh, um, okay. I also have different resources. If anybody is interested, um, I did send these to Naomi. You could reach out or maybe we could put them somewhere where they're accessible. Um, just about different visual schedules. So this is just one that I have. You can tailor them to your own um, you know, what your own child needs. And there's all different types. And my screen is not cooperating. Give me a second. Okay, so this one is geared toward an after school routine chart. Um, and it's just giving them, like I said, just that visual expectation of what is, you know, required. So this is a sequence of six steps. Um, where for virtual learning or say before virtual learning or after wherever you see kind of if there's a breakdown happening and they might need that redirection um this is great and you know there's all different pictures that you can put into those slots to kind of just give them a visual cue of okay this is what i need to do at this time and it also gives them that sense of okay this stuff is finished you know because think about yourself you know the journal industry and the planner industry is a multi-million dollar industry because people like to see like what they've accomplished and it's the same for our students and i have a i have a variety of different ones like depending on what your needs might be and these are also editable so um you know you could really do them according to whatever your child's needs are i also have a whole um bunch of activities i know that i had seen on the previous chat that just talking about germs and what's happening now with covid um so this was a lesson that i used with my students um just about initially like wearing masks which i think all of our kids are pretty used to at this point but in september it was really useful for our students um you know be a germ buster washing hands, using a tissue, um, you know what, if anything else, these are just things that can be utilized to give them that visual break, like away from a screen and also to create a social story, which I think is really important for us to do with our kids, um, you know, to help explain really what's going on. This is really great for younger kids. And plus, like, there's a lot of fun games like Goodbye Germs. This is a great fine motor game. They could color the germ, cut it out, um, crinkle it into a ball. And then there's a garbage can that they could practice, you know, throwing it into or placing it into, you know, I talked about wheelbarrow walking and all of those different, um, you know, hard work activities. Like this could be like a break game, you know, that they have to crab walk, grab a germ, crab walk, go put it in the garbage can. Um, you know, and there's just so many activities in this. I can make this accessible if anybody wants it. Um, another thing for older kids, which was great for my older students, um, was a COVID-19 time capsule. And this kind of just opened up the conversation to COVID and what's happening. Um, and it kind of let them 
you know, helped commemorate like this time in their lives. So it's basically what it is. It's time capsule and it's talking all about, you know, them at this time, you know, everything about them, what their favorites are, what they look like, um, who their best friends are, their shoe size, um, how they're feeling, you know, something socio-emotional wellness is something that um, has been particularly hard, I think, during this time, especially, um, you know, not only for younger students, but I think my daughter as well, last year had a very, very tough time. And um, there was, I think I saw it on Facebook, there was a video of, it was a girl and she was sitting on her bed in front of her laptop and the video kind of panned across the whole room and it showed like tons of trophies and ribbons and, you know, her on like the soccer field and all of these things. And then it just pans out to her sitting on her bed and just having all of these Google Classroom alerts, like missing assignment, missing assignment, F and all these things. And then you, it, the video starts speeding up and she's in the exact same position on her bed and her clothes changed, but she's like just sitting there staring at the computer. And I know for myself, I identified completely for my daughter with that video. And I think that just talking about emotions and their feelings during this time is important. Um, I know in my house, it was definitely something that we had to focus on. Um, you know, things that are happening in the community where you're living during this time. Um, so these are just resources that I have just been using in therapy with my students. And, you know, I really don't like to mix work and home, believe it or not. I can't be mom and OT to my kids at the same time. Um, but I have had to use some of these strategies with my own students, like a letter to myself. This was something um, really cool that we did. So I'm going to come back. It's about 920. Okay. I feel like I've chewed everybody's ear off and I don't know if anybody has any specific questions or um, That is amazing information. That's a lot of stuff. I was definitely thinking I have you know, two of my own, so I'm thinking, you know, they're each different, right? So I'm trying to uh, see how we can apply one thing versus the other. Um, and that's the thing, you know, like when it comes to sensory, like nothing is, um, everything is unique. Everybody's sensory system is unique um, because neurologically we're all different. So mm -hmm. strategies were completely different for, you could have even say, I'm um, just bringing it back to a diagnosis, just think about the students that I work with, like, you could have the same exact diagnosis and students have completely different sensory needs. And it's kind of the same thing just in human life, you know, like you think about where a bubble bath and a glass of wine might calm me down, you know what I mean? But somebody else needs something completely different to calm down. And that's actually your sensory system that mm -hmm. you have adapted for yourself just to deal with, you know, all the different sensory things that happen to us in life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so if you have any questions, feel free to um, just put them right in the chat or you can raise your hands and we can unmute you. Like you can either raise your actual physical hand or your hand <laughs> on Zoom. You. Yeah. Uh, but in the meantime, I do have a few questions that we had already received, so I wanted to share with you. But go ahead and, and go typing them in the chat. Um, but I, I had a question in regards to bedtime routines. You spoke about waking up routines. So can you talk a little bit about, I know a lot of parents have complained about their children are either sleeping in or having a hard time falling asleep. So what can we do as parents to support them in that way? Yeah, so believe it or not, you know, bedtime has become a huge issue. And a lot of it stems from the increased exposure and the increased work that their eyes are doing on screen. Because mm -hmm. believe it or not, them having to take in all of this extra sensory information through their eyes, their systems are completely in overdrive. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, by the time it's time for bed, their systems are ready to keep going. And we're like, no, please go to bed. And they legitimately are still crawling out of their skin. Um, so a good bedtime routine. And I have to tell you, I am the worst with bedtime routines in my house. I know it's horrible, but so we're um, done by then. We're all tired. Yeah. Like I'm done and I want to go to bed and, you know, I don't want to, you know, and my kids are older now. Like my daughter's going to be 14. My middle son is 11 and my youngest is going to be nine, you know, so I'm kind of like, 
come on, you guys are grown. You should be able to do this for yourselves now. But believe it or not, like we still have to set that standard for them. And it's something that I'm still learning is that they still look to us for that structure, especially since they're not getting it in school anymore. So they're almost ultra needy on us to give that to them, you know? And it's like, so something um, that, you know, there are tons of things that we could do, right? So there is um, creating like a showering slash bath time, set time routine that they know, like prepping them in advance, like, okay, you know, in a half hour, we're going to start getting ready for bed. Um, but also before you even start that, a good thing to do is doing a lot of deep pressure activities. Um, that kind of helps the body to wind down. You know, so you don't really want to be doing something extreme. I know like when I was younger, I was like, I used to want to kind of run my kids, like run them ragged before they went to bed. But believe it or not, with this type of um, input that they're getting, it's actually good to do like a lot of calming, deep pressure. Um, like sometimes, hold on, my daughter's sitting at the table and she's shaking my screen so bad. <laughs> um, you know, just like taking a pillow and having them lay on their stomach and doing like a big pat down. Like what I do with my younger students is I always say like, if I'm working with Giovanni, okay, let's make a Giovanni sandwich. And I take a cushion or a pillow and I'm like, what are we putting first thing on Giovanni sandwich? And you know, he'll say lettuce. And I take the pillow and I just give him a lot of just deep pressure. And it's that same idea that you just want those joints to feel a sense of sustained kind of input and calmness. Even, um, you know, there's actually also this, I didn't bring it up today and I was going to share the screen, but I don't have sound like when I was sharing. So maybe we could put it somewhere now. See, maybe I'll post it on the parent page. Um, something that I wanted to do many, many years ago with my students in my school um, is this whole, I don't know if you ever heard of it. And I hate that Justin Bieber is doing it now because I feel like <laughs> It so has like now taken on like, oh, that's a Justin Bieber thing. But he does this thing called tapping and it actually is working on all the meridians of the body. And it's kind of like this mindful tapping. And there's these five different sectors of your body. And as you tap, you kind of have these affirmations that you say to yourself. And it's actually being used for a ton of different things. Like it's being used for weight loss and like you know, for anxiety, but it's also extremely calming. So you could use it as a time with your child at the end of the day to kind of touch base with them, check in with them, and just kind of talk about your reaffirmations of like the positive things that they did through the day. Um, another great thing, you know, is, um, let me think, what did I talk about? Um, tapping, deep pressure, definitely setting that routine, like a visual schedule is extremely helpful so that they could kind of see like, okay, I still have to brush my teeth, you know, and having them actually kind of either check something off or move something to show that it's completed just gives the body a sense of, um, you know, kind of, okay, I'm done. And it gives that signal, like I'm done with what I have to do for the day. Um, you know, I'm not going to talk much on essential oils because they are, you know, kind of very varied about who uses them and who believes them and not, but I am a user of essential oils. And I know for myself, my kids know once I put on the diffuser and they start to smell certain smells, it kind of sets off like something in their brain, like, oh, that's the bedtime smell, you know? And they kind of like, I notice an instant calm in them, yeah. um, you know, but back to just the whole science behind this, you know, melatonin is produced in your body depending on um, the sun, actually sunlight. Um, and, you know, when your visual receptors, believe it or not, um, and you might not even know it, aren't taking in those, that sunlight and those vitamins, your body doesn't produce melatonin or it could be disrupted. And they are actually doing research on um, their ability to sit in front of a screen and take in all of this information and the body's production of melatonin. So that is, you know, it is really like a scientific thing as to why now bedtime routines are completely skewed. So what you're saying, I'm just trying, I'm truly in awe. So what you're saying- I'm sorry, I know I talk in all of the places. No, this is to, amazing. Like, I'm, like, really I'm, in. I'm such a geek for these things. So the fact that they're not taking in the sunlight, it's yeah. actually affecting them. So 
would it be time. helpful to definitely make it a point that they go outside? I mean, I would definitely, even if it's freezing cold, put on their jackets, put on their scarves, put on their hats, just go outside for a 15 minute walk. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that, getting that, that sunlight, it's not only the exercise, it's yeah. legitimately a vitamin D and melatonin issue. You know, um, oh, wow. the cool. bodies need it. You know, when I was working, it's funny, you know, I worked at the Lavelle School for the Blind for many, many years. And for my kids who didn't have light perception, their bodies did not make melatonin. So they did not have these sleep-wake cycles. So that's where like, and you know, melatonin is something that now has really been on the market as like a natural sleep aid, but your body might genuinely not have enough of it for those receptors to like kick into, you know, bedtime mode. So that's definitely, yes, that would definitely be helpful. That's awesome. And um, I just wanted to make sure that we did cover all of the, um, that we were able to answer yes. Nancy's question. She says, I learned what sensory overdrive was now. I can see how it's affecting them. I start the routine at seven, but they don't actually go to sleep until 10, 11. I am with you, Nancy. I understand. Okay. Uh, what do you recommend I do to get them to lower that sensory overdrive? Um, I would definitely suggest I know you touched on a lot and you gave some really good tips, but I just want to make sure that if there was anything else that we can add to that. Yeah, I would definitely say, you know, even keep like, I know for myself, I need to kind of even keep notes on myself, on my own kids. You know what I mean? Of exactly what they're doing, because sometimes like I get so involved with my day and then I'm like oh my god like he didn't have a break oh my goodness like we didn't do mm -hmm. this so like really kind of looking at your daily schedule and making sure that they have enough movement breaks through the day so it's not just like okay we're done and now it's like this big explosion of energy so definitely slotting those movement breaks through the day um you know another good regulator is blow suck activities so doing anything with like a straw, bubbles, any type of heavy, um, you know, I, sometimes like I'll give them like say pudding for dessert and they have to suck it through a straw. That deep pressure and that activity um, actually is a big regulator. So any type of like, even if during in bath time, like having them like take a bubble wand, I mean, of course, let's talk like age appropriateness, right? Like for a little kid, um, blowing bubbles, any of that type of stuff. Um, and I would really say, you know, deep, try the deep pressure, you know, even teaching them like how to give themselves like squeeze massages, um, deep pressure hugs, all of that type of stuff will help you to calm your system down. Yeah. I'm so glad that you touched on that because one of the questions that, you know, were brought up was about every child has had a meltdown at some point um, in virtual learning. Uh, there's been tears, there's been computers smashing. I mean, oh, yeah. it happens. Uh -huh. um, so it was precisely about, you know, a lot of what the tips you gave us are preventive, right? Proactively what we can do. Yes. But what are those like things that will interrupt that very moment when it's like, they're in tears. And I've seen it with my own children, just like, come here, like, you know, cause we yeah. will, if we continue pushing at that point and, you know, we, as you, many of you know, we have a virtual learning uh, support system. So we have children from 10 different school districts. We are seeing so many different learning styles and learning approaches. And of course, you know, in, in the virtual learning system, we, we cannot hug those kids, but I've done it with my own. And it's like, that's what ends it. So sometimes you literally yeah. just and have you know to what? Not for the way. Sometimes you just need to turn off the computer, shut yeah. the computer, yeah. and Absolutely. like give it a break. Because exactly. I've had to reach out to my to my children's teachers multiple times yeah. and like, look, I'm sorry, like we didn't log back on. We really needed a break, you know, yeah. and we'll catch up because you know sometimes they just and and I know for myself, I am a very anxious person in nature <laughs> so like then I get anxious something isn't working they're getting frustrated I'm doing my thing I can't help now I'm frustrating they're feeding off my frustration yes. and then we're both spinning around in circles and um you know nothing gets accomplished so yeah. sometimes like I just tell them like we just need to take a break you know like yeah. and also something that we've been working on a lot is just a lot of 
breathing, believe it or not. You know, sometimes when we're caught up in the heat of that moment, we forget to breathe. Um, and something like that, I start every single, you know, whenever I see it going that way is like, okay, we're, we're taking a breathing break. And I mean like really deep breaths. And that's why, like, I also have like a lot of breathing games, you know what I mean? Like having a tissue here and having to like blow it to the other side of the table. That way you're really seeing that breath working. Um, you know, I'll take a straw and like have a piece of paper and they have to like breathe in so that they're sustaining a deep breath and keep that paper attached to the straw. Um, breathing is huge. And I know, like, I know for myself, I don't breathe enough during the day. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, I'm trying to teach them how to be good breathers. Yeah. You even have now um, the Apple watch that reminds you like, yes. take a breathing and, and then do this for a minute. So this is great. So much to implement. And I really hope that everyone that has logged in tonight uh, is walking out with some tips and some things, but just to, I think, to summarize and from the notes that I took, definitely that schedule and having a visual of what is happening. And one of the things that I wrote, it's being able to look away from the screen every 30 minutes at least, that's huge. So let's start implementing these things. Um, but I think that's so much of what you share, we can implement for ourselves. Uh, okay. and it, because we can't give what we don't have. So we have to kind of reset that first, right? Reset ourselves in order to be able to give. I wanna be um, respectful of everyone's time. I can't believe we're out of time already, guys. We're over, um, but it's just, there's so much to learn. There's so much that we can uh, support each other with. Um, and I wanna say first, thank you, Petra, for sharing your knowledge, your experience. You're amazing. Thank you. Um, I'm just I'm trying to survive being a mom and working. That's really all that I'm doing. Just trying to survive like everybody else. Yeah, just because I know you, I'm going to dare to say, guys, if Petra is, is willing to share this information, she truly is just such a, such a wealth of knowledge and um, she's awesome. You can definitely pick her brain at some point. Obviously, if it goes after a certain time, then you do have to start paying her therapist. <laughs> so you just do have to do that. But in the meantime, I do want to say, you know, thank you so much for that and uh, remind everyone that none of us has it figured out. And there will be times when you think that, you know, you're, you're failing at this and everybody else has it figure it out the truth is we don't and nobody knows, what, they're doing. And that, nobody nobody knows what we're doing no, who knows what they're doing nobody yes. has this figured and, out and i wanted to touch on that in regards to the teachers as well that even the teachers are so understanding and speaking as a teacher right so feel free to just send a chat and say hey teacher this and that such and such needs a break, we'll be right back. And I've done that in our program where we had to take a child and wait for them to finish crying and then bring them back. Don't leave them in front of the screen having a meltdown because then that's worse. You know, it's now they're creating all these memories and all these emotions around a virtual learning. Um, so I just, it was something I wanted to share because we've experienced it so much. Um, but I also want to remind the parents that there are resources out there. There are people that would help you. And we're going to circle back with an email with some resources places that you can call if you get to a point where you can't handle it you get to a point where your child is unable to handle it, you're seeing symptoms of anxiety depression don't just think they're going to get over that because they won't you know don't think don't, don't just tell them to to wash it off and you know move on you know take a deep breath and do it man up woman up let's not do that this isn't the time for that this is the time for us to say I'm here. I love you. Say it to yourself. It's going to be okay. And um, we're definitely going to be able to send that email, right? With it. So I'll add some organizations in the area in Bergen County and Essex County that are there to help you at no cost. They can provide counseling. They can come home. They can do it virtually. They can help you if you get to a point where you truly feel like I can't take this anymore. You're not alone. There are resources and we want to make sure that we share them with you. And I would say also share this with others, Yes. right? So we're providing you guys these resources. Some of you may use some of these things. Some of you know other people 
that can benefit from these resources. So let's all come together as a community. And one thing that we started doing recently um, on our website is posting blog posts. Yes. So last week we we posted a nice article on the power of yet, yes. right? Just adding yet to Read the end it. of any sentence, really powerful stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this week we did another one on empowering versus enabling. Great article, great stuff. So check that out, read it for yourself share it with others, share this information. Um, anybody who wants any of the stuff that Petra was sharing on, on uh, today, tonight, uh, just send us an email and we'll reply back to you. We're we'll happy to share that with you, share it with others, share it on Facebook. Um, are we gonna do this again? Absolutely. I just posted our blog uh, link directly on the chat. So make sure you click on it so it opens up and then you can read that. Um, we will. We had so many different themes and so many questions and so many areas from ranging from helping ourselves as parents, also how to help the children balance the information they're receiving, how to, you know, healthy practices, nutrition, food. So we are preparing um, to do this once a month. So we are so awesome. excited to be able to do this. And if you know some really awesome people who are great at what they do in any of these areas that can support a parent's experts, whether you are one, send me a private message and we'd love to connect and use your knowledge and what you know how to do in this process of parenting because we have to share and support each other. Absolutely. So the next one is going to be the last, so we're reserving the last Friday of the month as long as it continues to work. So the last Friday of February, we said it's 26. the, the 26th. So you're gonna receive um, some information as to how to log in and we're going to do it again. And please share with your friends what you have okay. learned and hopefully we can have more, more parents come and join us. Awesome. Any other questions before we go now? Did everybody have a good time? Ask that. There's, a, there's tons of questions. I'm sure there's <laughs> <laughs> tons more, but thank you guys all so much. Um, and we will see you next month. Peter, thank you. You are amazing yes. wealth of information and knowledge. Thought. You're it's awesome. Amazing. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. Oh, you can also, Petra is on our family group, uh, on the Zensai family group. So I know a lot of you guys are in there. So you can reach out there and just post a question there. So yes. any follow-up questions. All right. Bye, Have everybody. Have a great night, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your wine. <laughs> <laughs>